All the Way, which was also turned into a film on HBO starring Brian Cranston about Lyndon Johnson, who is near and dear to my heart as well. Uh, overall, he's written, written 14 original full-length plays. He's been nominated for Emmys. He's written two musicals, a number of one-act plays. He has a movie coming out uh, in November, Hacksaw Ridge. He's written other films as well. He starred, he was an actor on Star Trek, uh, and he's starting a new project, which I just can't wait to learn more about in the future. Uh, on the origins of the KKK. So please uh, join me in welcoming Robert Shenton. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so why don't we start, for, for all of you, the, the quick 10 second summary. Uh, for most of you probably saw all the way, the first half is about the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and the second part is about uh, Lyndon Johnson's election uh, defeat of Barry Goldwater in 1964. Can we start by uh, maybe telling us a little bit about why you chose to write about Johnson in this period? Sure. I, uh, I grew up in Austin, Texas, a um, uh, hill country, which is where uh, LBJ was born and raised and rose to power. And uh, so he was uh, a presence in my life. Uh, my father had a very small kind of unique uh, encounter relationship uh, with then Senator Johnson. My dad was a pioneer in public television and radio in this country and he was hired by the University of Texas to come to Austin and create the first public television and radio station really in the Southwest. And uh, job number one was to get the permission of then Senator Johnson because it would have been a direct competitor with his own media empire or should I say Lady Bird's media empire because, of course, it was in Lady Bird's name. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, Senator Johnson not only gave his permission, but as president would go on to sign into law the bill that created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and is responsible for what we think of today as national radio and national television. Um, so in my house growing up, uh, he was one of the good guys. And, um, uh, there's actually a, a, a family story, somewhat apocryphal, uh, about an invitation to visit the ranch and our station wagon getting stuck in the mud and uh, Senator Johnson coming out in his truck and putting his shoulder to the wheel and helping us get the car out of the ditch. I don't know if this is really true. It's a great story. Um, I'm too young to remember him, so I asked my oldest brother if he remembered meeting Senator Johnson. He said, oh, yeah. Said, well, what was he like? He said, you know, it's funny. I I don't actually remember Johnson. What I remember is how incredibly respectful our father suddenly became around this strange man, <laughs> which in its own way is maybe a more apt and interesting descriptor. Um, that election, the 64 Goldwater election, uh, is the first election I participated in. Uh, I was 11 years old, so I had my button and the stickers on my books. My mom took me down to Congress Avenue. I got to volunteer, and I got to stay up late and watch the returns come in. And in the Manichaean world of American politics in 1964, it truly seemed like the victory of light over dark. Um, 18 months later, troop levels in Vietnam have gone up from 25,000 to 170,000, and my oldest brother is approaching draft age, and I begin to have a different feeling about LBJ. Um, so he's always been in my he's always been in my head. He's he was uh, an extraordinary figure. I think one can can accurately call him a Shakespearean figure in the sense um, that he was outsized. I don't just mean physically, and he was physically big, a very tall man, uh, heavy set, imposing, intimidating, deliberately intimidating, but big in his ambitions, big in his virtues and his vices big in his triumphs and his failures. Um, a really extraordinary individual who had an outsized impact on the American political landscape. And this year, the year that I focus on in the play all the way, November 63, immediately after Kennedy's assassination, Johnson becomes president, to November 64 in his reelection, um, is a turning point in, in American political history. I believe it began it, it begins a political cycle there 
out of which we are just now beginning to emerge. So the question I've thought about since I first saw the play is one I often have when I write books about Congress. How do you make it both exciting uh, and create some kind of narrative? Because Congress is messy, the process of passing a bill is just chaotic, and yet your whole first act is really about the ins and outs of getting a bill through Congress. How did you figure out and think of how to tell that story in a way that would be riveting? Well, I, you know, as in any storytelling, uh, it's, it's critical to make the stakes real and as high as possible, and, and goodness, they could hardly be higher in, in this case. What you have is the United States finally, finally confronting its racial legacy uh, and uh, Jim Crow. And it is, uh, it is an epic battle uh, at the end of which Jim Crow will be defeated and uh, an entire demographic that had heretofore been disenfranchised will um, become full citizens and that will change the politi political landscape dramatically. So the stakes are incredibly high. Um, the other part of that is that the you have characters that you care about, characters um, who are compelling, characters who are complicated, not, not simple, not black and white, but really complicated. And in this moment in time, uh, we were blessed with an extraordinary assembly of politicians, uh, citizens, um, actors, really uh, uh, amazing people, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Bob Moses, uh, Lyndon Johnson, Hubert Humphrey, Dr. Martin King. I, I mean, it's, you, you, you're hard pressed to think of another time where such individuals emerged uh, in, in a moment of crisis. And so the, the combination of the, the, the stakes being high and characters who are uh, uh, fascinating, complex, compelling, um, is the sort of thing that I always look for, and in this case, uh, you, you really have an abundance of blessings. Um, and then it's about putting that together in a way that makes sense for an audience so that you understand the forces back and forth, that this was not a given. This, this was not a victory that, that was going to happen. It was hard fought. People literally gave their lives for it. Uh, people had died in this cause, and, uh, and victory was not assured, and, and, and that makes it you know, all that much more compelling. Um, so, And then uh, when the play, I can't remember, it was around when the play came out, um, uh, the movie Selma also came out uh, with, uh, by Ava DuVernay, and there was this unexpected debate about Lyndon Johnson that emerged. Uh, her portrayal of it, um, your play was brought into it. How do you see Lyndon Johnson and his commitment and interest and relationship to the civil rights movement? Yeah. Um, you know, there are, there are people who, who uh, still believe or make the uh, assertion that Johnson uh, was a Purely a political opportunist and had no personal feelings whatsoever about civil rights, saw it as an opportunity, as a wedge issue, if you will. Um, I am not among those people, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, Johnson uh, grew up in a rural environment, uh, and his family lost, uh, they were the middle class and kind of rising, and his father had some political ambitions, and then they lost everything. They lost everything uh, in, the, in the cotton market. And, and Johnson knew firsthand what it was like to be poor. He knew firsthand what it was like to be hungry. And he knew firsthand what it was like to be looked down upon because you were less than. And I think that stayed with him. That's number one. Number two, he, um, his only job outside of politics, the first job he had was as a teacher. Uh, in an elementary school in Catula, Texas. And uh, this was largely uh, Hispanic students, um, children of immigrants, legal, illegal. And he talked often 
about that year and how, uh, what an effect it had on him. Like all things Johnson, he threw himself into it, uh, created all kinds of programs, and, and he, he spoke with great warmth about the intensity uh, that these students brought to school, their desire to learn, uh, and also that for each of them there would come this moment where he, he would see them experience racism and how devastating that was, the realization that they were, they were to be looked down upon as other because of the color of their skin. And that, he never forgot that. The proof, I think, of his early commitment to this is a speech he gave at Gettysburg when he was still vice president. You know, when he became vice president, he used to tell this, this joke about, uh, because he hated being vice president. He, he had gone from the most powerful man in the Senate and Congress to being vice president. He used to tell this joke about a man had two sons, and one of them joined the Navy, and one of them became vice president of the United States, and neither one was ever heard from again. <laughs> Or, or more graphically, being vice president isn't worth a bucket of warm piss. That was the other thing he used to say about it. So anyway, the Kennedy administration kept him on a very short chain. So they sent him off to go to Gettysburg, give a speech on the anniversary. Nobody was very going to care much about this. There was some press there. Well, he gave this humdinger of a speech in which he talked about how the sacrifice by the men on this field had not been honored because the promises made in terms of integration had not been kept and that we could no longer keep saying to African Americans, just wait, the time isn't right now, just wait a little longer. This, this speech was so shocking, it got a lot of attention and the Kennedy administration got very nervous and pulled him back. But this was a speech he needn't have given on a subject he needn't have picked. He picked that. And when he became president on the heels of Kennedy's tragic assassination, the big question was, so what does President Johnson want? And he made it clear very quickly that what he wanted was civil rights. And as I say, that was not a given. In essence, he was betting big and putting all his chips, all his political goodwill chips on this issue. And, and I think he deserves the credit for that. There's a lot of things that, uh, a, a lot of terrible mistakes that Johnson made and for which he bears responsibility. But in this instance, I think he deserves full credit. And there was one, one of my favorite line in the uh, play and the film is uh, when Johnson is, he's in a debate about voting rights, I believe, uh, the, uh, whether voting rights should be part of the Civil Rights Bill, and he's getting mad because he's getting criticized for not going as uh, expansive as possible. He says, this is not about principle, it's about votes, um, which is really, I think, a, a line that gets to some of the essence of what you were writing about. Can you talk about... Um, about how that fits in the play yeah. and film. Well, I'm, I mean, the play is very much uh, about uh, the nitty-gritty of politics, uh, the human part of politics, how it gets done, what Bismarck uh, described as the sausage-making of politics. Um, and, uh, you know, we live in a time where um, it is popular and fashionable uh, to dismiss politics and politicians as you know, without principle and without value, and uh, and 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 it's a it's a grossly unfair representation. There are many many good people trying to do important work uh, on our behalf. Um, the one of the uh, uh, terrible uh, developments over the last twenty years in this highly partisan uh, atmosphere um, is this notion that one must never compromise, that to compromise is the ultimate sin uh, and the ultimate failure. Um, this is an absurd assertion. We live in a representative democracy, a two-party system, 
not a monarchy, not a dictatorship. You can only pass legislation if you achieve a majority, and most of the time, you do not have a majority within your own party, which means you must cross the aisle and make a deal. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. And Johnson was a master of the deal. He understood that to get a little, you got to give a little. And, and this is, you know, we sit, can say this in a very sort of funny way, but it's a painful process. It's a painful process because you are giving up things that are important to you, that are important to you that people have died for in some instances and, and form the part of the core of your principles. And to give that up is painful. It, it costs you something. And yet, this is how progress gets made. And, um, and it was very important to me in this play to really live in that world and experience that from these people, how they struggle. One of the things that I'm most proud of in the play is the approach I take to, to Dr. Martin Luther King, which is not one that personally I've seen before this. When Americans think of Dr. King, they think of either the orator or the martyr. And they never think of Dr. King, the politician. And in fact, Dr. King was a brilliant uh, politician. The fact that he was able to keep the civil rights movement together for as long as he did, moving pretty much in tandem for as long as he did, is a testament to that skill set. The civil rights movement, contrary to popular belief, was not a monolith. Uh, it was, in fact, a group of very small organizations, typically headed by one very charismatic individual who had very strong opinions about what should be done and how it should be done. And it's a tribute to Dr. King that he was able to get these different people working. That would be all the way from the very conservative old guard of the NAACP to <clears throat> this new emerging and very activist and creative student movement, uh, uh, SNCC, um, and uh, Student Nonviolent Committee, uh, and, and to, to bridge the gap between these two groups, uh, separated by age and by political uh, uh, philosophy, was really extraordinary. And, and it's important to, to understand that about Dr. King. It's important to understand that as we look at politics today, and particularly where we are right in this presidential election season. Do you think I'm often asked uh, if politics is more bitter and divisive today than it was 30, 40 years ago, or 50 years ago? Was it? Uh, I, I do. I, I think. Um, I think for a number of reasons. One, uh, as I say, this notion that compromise is now off the table. Um, uh, two, in 1964, both parties were uh, actually tripartite. They, they had a very healthy middle, but each party also had a liberal wing and a conservative wing. The, the Democratic Party had a very conservative wing as well as a healthy liberal wing. And, and the Republican Party, as shocking as it sounds, had a very healthy liberal wing as well as a deeply conservative wing. So this gave you some flexibility. Number three, the uh, amount of money sloshing through the political system today doesn't even, I, I mean, it, there's just no comparison between 1964 and today. In 1964, you know, you'd step off the Capitol grounds and paper bags of cash would be exchanged. Well, now, you know, well, we should put that to shame, you know, with millions and millions of dollars flowing through under this absurdly stupid Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. Um, um, so that's a, that's a terrible, terrible problem. And, and as a consequence of the cost of election, because there's now so much money and it's inflated, um, pretty much 50, 60% of what a representative has to do now is fundraise. They, they don't spend that time in Washington getting to know not only their own party members, but members across the aisle, because they have to go back and they have to raise money. It's a, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very terrible uh, uh, precedent. And finally, of course, uh, gerrymandering has been raised. Gerrymandering has always been with us, of course. But uh, thanks to the surgical precision of technology, we can now gerrymand in a way that uh, our forefathers could only have dreamed 
about. <clears throat> and so what we have done, in essence, is create districts that are so safe now uh, for uh, the, the representative that they only have to appeal to their base. It doesn't matter whether they get anybody else. It doesn't matter. They just have to base. So you have created a system that has, that has wrung all the flexibility out of it. Uh, and, and, and it's created a very, very difficult situation. And then you have uh, a political party, and let's just be very frank here, um, which has embraced the notion of obstructionism uh, as a tactic, that they will make government not work so that they can then talk about how government doesn't work, and so you shouldn't have government. Uh, and uh, this has been very successful uh, in terms of its political rewards in the short term. Uh, I think we are now seeing, they have now reached kind of the end of that tether, God, I hope they have. Uh, we'll, we'll see after November 8th, um, where, where that's gonna come back and bite them in the ass and, and it will seem less desirable, but it's wrecked havoc. It's wrecked havoc on the body politic because it has discouraged people. It's made people feel that government is not responsive and can't work. It doesn't work, and so it can't work, and so I will no longer be involved, which is part of the tactical decision here. So these are the things that I think that are working us, and they are very different than 1964. When you write a play like All the Way, and you've carefully crafted it, and then you get an actor like Brian Cranston, a larger-than-life presence, a phenomenal actor, does, it, does he change the play? And um, the film, obviously, but I'm thinking of yeah. That. Well, you know, getting Brian—that's uh, that's the old saw. If you can't can't be smart, be lucky. Um, <laughs> Brian r really was a, a is an extraordinary actor, a really transformative actor. And yes, he brought a, a, an enormous amount to the part, uh, and then to the subsequent film. Uh, Brian is a very smart uh, actor, not just intuitive, but very intellectual. And he has good story sense. He's a writer in his own regard. And um, so he brought in constantly new business, new ideas. He challenged uh, the work as it existed. And, and, and from my standpoint, as, a, as a, someone who works in what I think of as a highly collaborative art form, this is all to the good. This is what I like. I like this give and take. And uh, it, I, I, for my money, the best idea in the room wins. It doesn't have to be my idea. I'll claim credit for it later, but <laughs> it does not have to be my idea in the moment. So uh, getting Brian was uh, a fantastic and, and, and such a nice guy as well. Very funny and uh, such a, a warm presence. So we are really lucked out in that regard. And then how did you decide how you would tell the story to move from civil rights to the election of that election? You have a lot on the Atlantic City debates on the Mississippi Freedom Well, I, I mean, if, once I made the decision to, uh, because I could have written a number of plays about LBJ, a number of in interesting these years. plays. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, I, I could have written a play about his very first run for the House of Representatives. So it would have been a, a kind of a portrait of the artist as a young man, portrait of the politician as a young man. It would have been fascinating to see him as a young man learning the ropes. Uh, or I could have written a play about his first Senate campaign, the one he lost in the last minute uh, because his uh, opponent uh, had a handful of stolen votes. Um, or I could have written about his second Senate campaign, the one he won with a handful of stolen votes. <laughs> um, but I settled pretty quickly on the so-called accidental president this year because the arc of it was so inherently dramatic and beautiful. You have this, this uh, precipitating event, the shocking assassination of John F. Kennedy, thrusting him into the office. He achieves in this moment his life's dream, the thing that he has worked for 40 years in a way that nobody would want to achieve it. And the question is, what does Lyndon Johnson want? And then we see him fight this battle um, for civil rights, for the passage of the 64 bill, knowing all along that this will have, if he succeeds, it will have profound political consequences, both short-term and long-term. He famously said, 
and any number of people have recounted this anecdote, and it's in the play, who he says it to changes. But he famously said in the congratulatory throng after the signing of the 64 rights to an aide, some people say Bill Moyers, uh, what are you so happy about? The Democratic Party has lost the South for the rest of your lifetime and maybe mine. And they did. Only eight years later, Hubert Humphrey would run <coughs> in place of, six years later, sorry, in, um, in place of Lyndon Johnson, and Hubert Humphrey would win only one southern state. That's how quickly it changed. Um, how do we put together the Johnson in this play and the Johnson, you've written a sequel with the Great Society that covers Vietnam, which you've talked about today. How do we put those two Johnsons together? Is it the same person, the same calculation, the same approach to politics, or does something happen after 60? No, 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 it's the same person. And I actually, I, I have a critical scene. I don't, I don't talk about Vietnam a lot in, in this play all the way because it wasn't very important in this year. It's, what's shocking about Vietnam is that everybody says it was just a blip on the horizon. Nobody thought it was a big thing. Nobody thought it was going to be important. Nobody had any idea it would become what it became. And there's a moment, this, is a, this happened, this actually happened, um, and when I read it, I just was like, oh my God. Um, when I was doing my research, the uh, 24 hours during which the bodies of the three murdered civil rights workers in Mississippi are being uncovered is exactly the same 24 hours during which Lyndon Johnson is weighing his response to the Gulf of Tonkin event. And he will make the decision, the critical decision, to lie to the American people and to Congress happened in the Gulf of Tonkin and demand from Congress, which is happy to give him and gives him, I believe without a dissenting vote, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which makes Vietnam possible. All of that is happening. So you have the uncovering of the murder of these three young men and the, commis the simultaneous commission by decision in, in a private room between three individuals of a crime that will bury tens of thousands of men and women and children. And when I read that, I thought, well, fuck, that's a scene right there. <laughs> Do you think what happened, I'm trying to re now remember the exact sequence of how you put it together in the play, uh, but the decision in Atlantic City when there's a protest basically uh, to seat different delegation from Mississippi that wasn't all white, it was African American civil rights protesters, and, and uh, King accepts a compromise that Walter Ruther, uh, as a representative of the administration, pushes him to accept. Did that compromise the overall story you were trying to tell? Meaning, uh, was that compromise compromising the uh, civil rights struggle, as many younger activists thought? Absolutely. No, it, uh, it's a, we, it, you know, Americans typically, are, I doubt at 100 Americans, 99, maybe 100, would even remember that there was a convention in Atlantic City in 1964, what took place there. But what happened there was a terrible, terrible moment of political backroom maneuvering. And um, th very briefly, the Mississippi, uh, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, the young, uh, the youth movement had created Freedom Summer, sent volunteers down to Mississippi to register black voters who, of course, were completely disenfranchised. And, um, and they were shut out of the Democratic Party and so they created their own Democratic Party and, and, and put representatives from all over the state of Mississippi. It's kind of an amazing thing. And, create, and sent their own delegation to the Democratic Convention and demanded to be seated in lieu of the all-white Mississippi delegation, presenting President Johnson with a terrible choice. Uh, does he, even though he feels completely that the Mississippi Freedom Delegation is absolutely justified, but if he seats them in lieu of the white official Mississippi delegation, he fears that the entire South will walk out of the Democratic Convention 
on national TV just as he's girding his loins to go into battle with Goldwater. It is the quintessential terrible political choice. Any, any way you go is bad. Any way you go, you're going to hurt your constituency. And, uh, you know, Johnson was a real politic guy, and he made what he thought was the smart choice, which was to broker the sort of barest fig leaf of a compromise, uh, but not confront directly the racism of the Mississippi delegation. As it was, Mississippi did walk out and Alabama walked out, but nobody else did. He held the South. But the cost of this for those young men and women uh, of SNCC, uh, of the civil rights, this was the straw that broke the back in terms of the establishment and whether the establishment, the regular Democratic Party, would ever live up to its promises of equality. And for, for many of those people, that was the Rubicon. And, and I'm sure it hastened the demise of the uh, nonviolent movement in civil rights and the emergence of the black power movement. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, tough decision. Um, I was at a panel that... Uh, uh, Lou Gates, the professor of Harvard? Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Harvard, yeah. uh, and he, uh, he at, it was a mixed panel uh, of writers and politicians, uh, mixed in terms of race, and he asked everybody on the panel, if you were Lyndon Johnson, what choice would you have made? And they went down the panel, and, and, and everybody said, no, well, I wouldn't have made his choice. And then they said, so what's yours? And he said, hell yeah, I would have made his choice. It's the only choice that made sense in the moment politically. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's really, politics is complicated. Politics is hard, and politics matters. So you had written the play, and soon we're gonna get to Q&A, you had written the play by 2013 or something, 14, like, you, the, all the yeah. way. Uh, we, uh, its world premiere is uh, 2012, the election, okay, year, so election 20, year of 2012. And one of the figures in the campaign part of this is George Wallace, who in 64, most accounts of 64, they have that he ran, but it's not a major storyline like it'll be in 68. But you made it in the play. It was a big theme, and they had Im you had real images, if I remember, oh, and uh, video. Uh, Why? Why did you have so much of Wallace in 64? Well, Wallace is an important figure. Wallace is that, uh, you know, he's, he, he's a recurring theme, unfortunately, in American political history of the nativist race baiter. Um, and uh, sadly, he's not left us. Um, we have one today. Uh, Wallace uh, um, absolutely shaped and altered the political landscape. Um, he was a very real problem uh, in terms of the Democratic Party, and he made a very credible run for the presidency. What Wallace did is uh, he took the traditional Southern racist trope and made it palatable nationally by framing it as not specifically black, but big government versus the individual. So, so it was like the federal government is telling me and telling you how to live your life, and that's just not American. And um, this would, of course, be picked up and refined as the so-called Southern strategy of the Republican Party after the passage of the 64 and 65 <laughs> Civil Rights Bill. And um, so Wallace was a critical individual in this linkage of race and language, which then of course becomes more codified in terms of how we talk about race. You know, race becomes, Wallace had it was about the overweening power of the federal government, and then race became crime, then it became, you know, tough on crime, and it became law and order. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the dog whistles change, but the message remains the same. And so it's very important for me 
to have George Wallace in there because he was such a critical part of that. And then one last question before I open it up. Uh, can you talk, we've talked about this, but what uh, are the freedoms that you feel and don't feel to the historical record as you write a piece of work like this? Well, I'm, I'm always very careful in a public situation like this where I talk about my work to, to be very clear. Uh, I am not a historian. I am not a historian. I do not claim to be a historian. I do not play by those rules. I don't, I'm not a documentary maker. I don't even play by those rules. I'm a dramatist, uh, which means that although I often use history, real people, real events, um, as the subject for my plays or my film or my television productions, um, I will take liberties. Um, part of this is inevitable given the structure of the art form in which I operate. A play runs about an hour and 45 minutes, maybe a little longer. Well, to tell the story of 1960, November 63 to November 64 in 45 minutes, uh, you know, Bob Caro does that in three books, <laughs> each book about 5,000 pages. And, and Bob knows that you're going to read a chapter and then put it down on your bedside table and pick it up again at your leisure. Well, I don't have that. I have an hour and 45 minutes of your time, and I need to keep you at the edge of your seat interested in what I'm saying. So what that means is I'm going to have to omit a lot. And the minute you start taking things out of the narrative, you are changing the narrative. But it goes well beyond that. I very consciously change the narrative. I do use historical characters, and I will, as often as I can, use historical dialogue or dialogue that has come down to us. But I will also make stuff up. I will write dialogue. I will create characters. I will put people in a room who never occupied that room at the same time. Um, the one rule that I do make for myself, and I adhere to it scrupulously, because I think it's important, is that I will never have a character who is a historical character say or do something that I think is clearly antithetical to who they were, to who we commonly accept them to be. That is the line that I draw for myself, and I never cross it. OK, we have time for questions and answers. So just go to the mic, though, so we can uh, hear you. Right, right, these mics. And you might want to line up. I see a lot of hands. So if you can just go to the mic and ask your question, if uh, come on down. In your opinion, why did um, the most powerful man in the Senate uh, at the time give up that position for, as you said, a position not worth a bucket of? Oh, why did what? he become uh, vice president? On that, to become vice president. I know that uh, both the Kennedys disliked Johnson intensely, and they didn't want to have to go to him uh, and kowtow with legislation. How did they convince him to give that power up in a position where you're basically really nothing unless the president dies? Yeah. And in his Thanks. case, uh, it this, worked this out. Is a, it's a question that a lot of people have asked. Why, why did uh, Lyndon Johnson accept the vice presidency from John Kennedy? He, of course, had run against Kennedy and been beaten because Johnson ran an old-fashioned campaign and Kennedy ran a very modern campaign. I think he took it because he saw it as his only way into the White House. I think that's why he took it. I think it was a cold political calculation. I think he also imagined, naively as it turned out, that he would actually have more power than he wound up having. And he certainly tried to drag a lot of power with him. He, he really. He tried to bring some of the prerogatives and privilege of the Senate majority leader into the vice presidency, and the Senate very quickly disabused him of that notion. So I think it was a political decision. I remember the night that President Johnson decided not to run for re-election. And it was a difficult time for the country during that period of the 60s, and also um, his reflective period after he left the White House. If you were going to portray his life in a, in a play, of what it was like for him from the time he left to the time he died in terms of the things that he did well and the things that he might have regretted. What would that look like? 
uh, what would his life after he left the White House yes. look like? Well, we, I mean, we know what his life, he, he actually retreated yep. to his farm, to his ranch, grew his hair down to his shoulders, um, and, and, and really kind of dropped out. Uh, he sort of came back as they were building his library and the School of Public Affairs, and, um, and he was very, he became much more involved with that, and then he gave a few speeches as a consequence of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, one of which was a fairly significant speech on rights. Um, but he, I mean, I, he left, I think, very much feeling in disgrace and very much feeling guilty uh, over uh, the terrible losses in Vietnam. Vietnam, you can listen to telephone conversations between Lyndon Johnson and Senator Russell in 1964 in, in November 1964, with Johnson saying to Russell about Vietnam, I don't know why we're there, and I don't know how to get out. It's the damnedest thing. I don't know what to do. That's a, a did, did he maintain any relationships with Rusk or McNamara or Westmoreland during that period? No. no. And the incredible thing about those tapes is uh, Russell also, who's a Southern hawk, is expressing arguments that you'd expect from out. the anti what He's like, you have to get out. There's going to be a mess. It's not even important to the Cold War. In uh, Robert Caro's book, he uh, describes Lyndon Johnson as having this ability to be able to talk to someone and recognize uh, what they wanted and also what they were afraid of. And I was just hoping you could discuss maybe your play and maybe, you know, if there's any instances maybe with Everett Dirksen or some other character where that was represented. Well, I, I, the, the play is full of confrontation, uh, full of, uh, of scenes of Johnson maneuvering, and uh, part of the delight uh, of watching it is watching a master at work manipulating, wheedling, bullying, pleading, using all this full range of weapons at his disposal to get what he wants from a wide variety of individuals. So I very consciously uh, have tried to explore that aspect of, of his career. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to talk to with us today. Um, I was hoping you could speak a bit about the historical focus of your work, both this piece and the things you have coming up, and sort of what the value is in looking back in this particular piece of our history, which is fairly recent, but still tends to be pretty flattened out in how we narrativize it in a just sort of public education context. What, what are the things that we can do in fiction, in art, in film um, that we don't necessarily have access to when we're just approaching it from a strictly historical or political context? Um, and what are the questions that you ask yourself in a modern audience, uh, sort of looking back at this period, um, through your work that you hope that they get that they may not if they're just reading it in a history book? Great, great question. Um, I, I, I do think that um, in a, in a so-called history play, uh, and, and history plays go all the way back to the Greeks, uh, uh, the Persians in 316 BC, um, the, the thing about a history play or the thing about telling a, a, a story about history is that you can sometimes get at a contemporary issue in a way that doesn't put an audience's guard up. Whereas if you, if you try to brace the contemporary issue in a very direct way, people immediately uh, revert to their defensive fallback position. But by, by telling a story from the past, uh, you can kind of lull people into getting engaged in this and then hopefully the nickel drops for them at some point, either during the production or afterwards as they think about it, as the similarities between the issues being debated and fought over in the play begin to resonate as they think about their own life. And I, so I, I do think that there is this particular value um, to telling a story out of the past. Um, for myself, um, I don't pick my stories with a, a, a sharp, uh, you know, political partisan eye. I, I want a story that that uh, has me, that moves me, and that I think has relevance to today. But that's a very wide range of things. The movie that I have coming out November fourth, Hacksaw Ridge, um, is about Desmond Doss. I'm sure nobody in here knows about. Desmond Doss was the first conscientious objector 
to win the Medal of Honor. He was a pacifist who insisted on joining the army and refused to touch a gun. So, I mean, in America today, uh, the, the typical American movie about violence and guns is that the hero in the first act, as a matter of principle, rejects violence and the gun. And then by the second act, his family, and usually his wife, has been despoiled. And so in the third act, he picks up a gun and becomes a man. Desmond Doss never picks up the gun. He never picks up the gun. And that's a story I think that's really worth telling today because of where we are in terms of our feelings about violence and about masculinity. He, he models a very different kind of masculinity than, say, Donald Trump. I think that's a I think that's an interesting and valuable story to be telling. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sarah. Hi. <clears throat> Why do you think what do you think in LBJ's story and the story you told really what do you think resonated with the American people so much that your play became as popular as it did? Well, um, you know, I I, I think that um, a, the, the story of 1964 is really the origin story of 2016. It is a turning point and it creates a political cycle that, and, and, and a landscape that is very familiar to us and this explains a lot about it. I think that's interesting. Two, I think the struggles that these people, these men and women uh, have trying to achieve good inarguable good and how difficult that is resonates today because we see so much about the world that we would like to change or that we feel strongly about needs changing and yet often as not we feel frustrated and hamstrung and, and weak and we are, tend to give up and I think it's good to remind ourselves that people have succeeded, that we have made progress. Um, so I, I think for all those reasons um, it, it, it's, it's part of the appeal of the audience. I know that audiences for all the way tended to divide generationally. For those like myself who had lived through this time, it was painful to be reminded of what we had gone through and also to remember things that we had forgotten because we were so obsessed, I know I was as a young man, so obsessed about this issue or that issue that I actually lost track of so much. And then I look back at it and I think how narrow-minded I was in my focus. And then for the other half of the audience, the young generation, for them it's revelatory. He said what on the Senate floor? He really said that? People, that was the law? Really? You, really? I mean, it's shocking. And, and so it's important for them to see how much progress we have made. It's important not to give up. It's important not to be talked out of that. We've made enormous progress, and, and we mustn't forget that because it, we need to make more. We need to continue on. And, and so I think for all those reasons, that's why, that's why it struck a chord with people. Hi. Yeah, when you began, you, you mentioned something to the effect that uh, Lyndon Johnson set up a political structure that uh, remained intact up to the present moment where now it's unraveling. And I have to admit, I missed uh, what that, uh, un that what set up was, unraveling was. What I was. said was that a political cycle <coughs> began in 1964. Not that he constructed it, but that as a result of uh, uh, legislative achievements and political choices and decisions that he made, a, a political cycle began in that year, I think, 1964. The political landscape changes completely, you understand. The South, which has been democratic since Reconstruction, will become completely Republican. And here we are in 2016, and Hillary Clinton is ahead in Virginia, and ahead in North Carolina, and ahead in Florida, and Texas is in play, and Georgia is closer than it's been in 25 years. That's what I mean by now we're finally moving out of that cycle. But, it, you know, nothing ever stays the same in other areas. Simultaneously, the Midwest, which had long been a Democratic bastion, is trending Republican in, in, in key areas. It's never been true before. 
What's that about? That's an interesting development. So that's what I, I, I see 64 as the origin story for 2016. I think it helps us to understand a lot, but I also think nothing ever stands still and we are now, thankfully, I think, moving out. And because we don't know where we're going yet, because it hasn't solidified, that's part of this terrible anxiety that is being felt societally right now because we're moving, we're between stools. We're not where we were and we're not where we're headed. We're in that awful gray thing and we don't know where it's going and I think that's part of why the electorate feels so anxious. Why did you end the play with the, the play ends if I'm remembering correctly with King getting the tapes, my, uh, the tape recording? Well, there, there are several things that happen simultaneously yeah. at the end. Um, this is the FBI recordings of him and- This uh, is one of the, you know, just really most appalling uh, things about J. Edgar Hoover and, and the FBI <clears throat> is uh, Hoover ran this vendetta, uh, really, there's no other way to describe it against Dr. King uh, for a decade and uh, violated the law in, in, in almost every possible way. And one of the things that he did was uh, they had illegally uh, taped Dr. King in uh, some assignations that he had uh, outside his marriage. And then a, a collection, an edited tape recording of those intimate encounters uh, along with a letter, along with a letter ostensibly from an aggrieved Negro uh, telling Dr. King that he should commit suicide or he would, or this indiscretion would be made public. That's your tax dollar at work. That was sent to Dr. King and it went to his house and Coretta opened the package and, and heard the tapes. So I juxtapose the, at the end of the play, this tremendous success on the one hand, the, the Johnson landslide over Goldwater uh, and a, a landslide achieved in no small part uh, thanks to Dr. King and the efforts of the Civil Rights Movement, um, with uh, Dr. King's receipt of the, of the tape recording at his house and LBJ's own acknowledgement of the fact that, uh, privately to Hubert Humphrey, that yes, we won big, but we look at the states we lost, they're all southern states. So it's this sense of a victory, an absolute victory, but a victory with a price tag, and, and a victory that intimates that this is not going to last, the fight is not over, the war hasn't ended, and, and that leads, of course, to the second play, The Great Society. And how did you portray, think of your portrayal of Hubert Humphrey? He's another interesting figure that you know people don't remember. He was a giant on Capitol Hill before the 60s on yeah. civil rights. He manages the civil rights bill, and then by 68, he's the establishment. I mean, how did you think of him while you were writing? Well, I mean, I, I think Hubert Humphrey's a tragic figure. Uh, he was uh, uh, an absolute leader in civil rights. Uh, uh, he made his political bones uh, at the Democratic Convention in Minnesota with his famous speech about the sunshine of civil rights and, and forced the Democratic Party to put civil rights in the pl in, as a plank in the campaign for the first time. Um, and, by the, and then he becomes Johnson's vice president and essentially neutered. Um, it's a really painful, he's publicly humiliated and just, Johnson treats him terribly. And, uh, and is very slow to give him full support when Humphrey runs after Johnson uh, decides to the race. And you know, that election, you know, we talk about every vote matters, that election between Humphrey and Nixon was just a fraction of a percentage point. And there are many people who say that if, the, uh, if, if it had been another week, because Humphrey was gaining steam, if it had been another week, Humphrey would have won. And how different, how different things would have been, we'll never know. A tragic figure. Can you ever imagine uh, a story in which LBJ tries to operate today as a politician? <laughs> uh, I can't. Uh, I mean, I, not for me personally, but yeah, I would love to see. Uh, I mean, he'd have a lot to say about today. 
it, it, would, be, it would be interesting to, to hear him talk. Some of it would be very familiar to him, and some of it would be shockingly new. It would be interesting to hear him respond to it. Wow. What would be shockingly new? What would be shockingly new? Well, I, I mean, LBJ was, uh, as I say, you know, he, he grew up in the South uh, in the uh, uh, 30s and 40s and 50s. So um, the populist race baiter was a figure that <laughs> he certainly was familiar with. Uh, but Trump has taken this into a whole unique kind of world. LBJ would be very familiar with the idea of the big lie, Goebbels' you know, famous assertion that in order to, to lead the populace uh, along the direction you want, you simply tell the big lie over and over and over again until they accept it as the truth. But, but Trump doesn't do that. Trump is, Trump is the, the internet version of that. He's the coked up, amped up, uh, uh, version of that. It's not one big lie. It's one big lie followed three minutes later by another, followed three minutes later by another, followed three minutes later by another. And so it's the sheer volume of you, you're, you're still trying to untangle and rebut lie number one, and we're already in lie number seven. It's what makes these, uh, these debates so frustrating uh, if the moderator is not going to challenge the participants on the validity of their assertions, then it forces the um, opposition to do that, and you're spending so much time rebutting what's just been said that you never get a chance to get around to say what you would like to say. So I think he'd be pretty, he'd be pretty amazed uh, at that, and amazed at the whole notion of this internet and social media and how that works. I mean, he was. You know, he was in the beginning of television, and he recognized how important television was, but he felt very self-conscious about it. He didn't think he, he didn't feel very good at it. And uh, he would be flabbergasted at, at now what, what is capable, what is possible. And uh, I think he'd be a little intimidated by it, quite Is frankly. he like George Wallace? What? I mean, does he come from the George Wallace part of your story? Trump? Trump. Oh, very much so. Oh, yes. No, no. The... The whole uh, codification of race baiting, uh, Trump is the natural expression of that, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we'd, we'd have gotten there sooner or later. Trump brings some unique qualities to the table. Uh, uh, but, uh, but yes, the language, the, the codification, or, or even the, what's kind of shocking about Trump in some ways is the rejection of even the codification. He just goes there. He just goes there. That's what's kind of shocking about it, I think, is, is heretofore politicians have tended to shade that expression. Everybody knows what they're talking about, but Trump just goes there, you know, rapists and robbers, I mean, you know, and, and African Americans all live in inner ghettos where their, you know, their lives are meaningless, and I mean, he just goes there. Um, it's per that's shocking. Why didn't, we have time for a few more questions. Um, why didn't you write, was Goldwater in the play? Uh, yes. As yes. a character, I mean, well, I mean, he remember was, the film. He's not, he's not, uh, he's not in, the, in the final Broadway version right. and the published version, but there was a Goldwater uh, character. He only appeared in, uh, in uh, one scene, kind of a great scene with uh, Wallace. Um, but uh, as always, when you're developing a play, you know there's there's art and then there's commerce, and uh, you you have a limited amount of funding and a limited amount of time, and you have to eliminate the <coughs> characters and events and scenes in order to get things into a manageable. And so this was a character who who went off stage, and that worked just fine. Honestly, we didn't miss him. If you didn't know he had been there, you wouldn't you wouldn't wish he had. Um, <laughs> I mean, Goldwater's a very interesting character, but uh, in this instance, it's more useful sometimes to have a character off stage that you talk about than to have one who's on stage. Uh, the threat of the off stage character can be kind of interesting to play with. And you showed, did you have film of him or no? I don't remember. Yes. Yeah, you had yeah, film. Absolutely, yeah. Was that in the writing or is that a decision you make in the production to have the actual? No, film? no, it's in the, I, 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 my script is, the stage directions are, pretty detailed about what I want. And, and then in the productions themselves, in the world premiere, I'm very, very involved 
in all those decisions. So I'm, I'm the guy looking at that tape with the designer and the director saying, no, I like this segment. No, I, we have to have the, you know, uh, excess and defense of liberty is no vice and uh, moderation and defense of justice is no virtue. Um, and now we have lock her up. You know, who would have thought that we would look back at, uh, at Goldwater and, and lament the, his rhetoric, <laughs> his sweeping rhetoric uh, today, but there you are. Okay, we're just about out of time. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, well, please thank me. Uh, thank Robert. Thank you. Thank you. And if you haven't seen all the work, go see it. It's fantastic, uh, fantastic stuff.